Now, you can listen to Wine and Dine Radio while shopping at the grocery store or your neighborhood wine merchant. Wine and Dine Radio can be heard using your wireless internet on your cell phone. You're listening to iWine Radio. iWine Radio is a production of Food Tastes Better with Wine on the web at iwineradio.com. Hey guys, I thank you for listening to iWine Radio and we are still the only wine channel on iTunes Radio. If you go look under iTunes Radio icon and scroll down to News and Talk Directory and it's listed alphabetically, click on that and the stream comes up immediately. iWineRadio.com where you can find links to individual guests. And if anyone's interested in advertising or becoming an underwriter or sponsor, please contact us at iWineRadio.com. We really, really appreciate your support. The more support we get, the more conversations I can have with fascinating people around the world, including you. If you have a story to tell that you'd like to share on iWine Radio, go to iWineRadio.com and contact us and we'll go from there. Hi, my name is Eric Asimov. I write about wine for the New York Times, and I hope you enjoy my new memoir and manifesto called How to Love Wine. And you can follow me on Twitter at at Eric Asimov. Welcome to Wine and Dine Radio. I'm Lynn Creelo chamberlain Hi there. This is Andreas Larson. Hi, this is John Capon. My name is Mathur Jaffrey. Hi, my name is Heike Platter. I'm from the Alto Adige region, or Sud Tyrol. Hi, my name is Paul Dolan. I am absolutely passionate about growing organic and biodynamic fruit for our wines. Hello, my name is Lorena Garcia. Hello, my name is Fritz Maytag. This is Joyce Bach. I'm the author of Foodie Fight. Hi, this is Lydia Mandave, founder of 29 Cosmetics. Cheers, this is Rob Barnett, CEO and founder of ThinVillage.com, where wine lovers connect. Today we're joining so many people in the media in the United States by capturing an interview with the Eric Asimov with the release of his brand new memoir and manifesto called How to Love Wine. How to Love Wine addresses subjects as varied as the rise of American connoisseurship, the tyranny of the tasting note, and what's wrong with scores. I particularly love this one title of a chapter that's called The Ark of Discovery and the Importance of Being Humble. And that is so, so very true. I'm quoting from Hugh Johnson. Eric Asimov sees through the snobby froth of 100-point scores and tutti fruity tasty notes. And another one from Danny Meyer, layered with logic. And I, I am uh, tend to be more left brain myself. And so, Eric, I, t- I, ag- I agree with your approach wholeheartedly and get rid of uh, so much of the emotion. But, of course, the, the pleasure is rooted in, in the emotion. So how does one dispel wine anxiety? That's your chapter one. Well, I, I just want to say, first of all, that I'm, I'm very happy to speak with you, Lynn, but I don't propose at all to get rid of the emotion. The whole point of the book is to restore the emotion. The, the, the premise of the book is that um, we've, we've conveyed to the American people, for the most part, that in order to simply enjoy wine, you have to know everything about it, in effect become a, uh, a, a connoisseur before you can enjoy yeah. wine. Yeah. And my feeling is that this formula is entirely backwards, that you have to develop an emotional attachment to wine, uh, to, to to wine. You have to fall in love with it. And then if you feel compelled to plunge more deeply into wine, you can. But you've established that initial relationship and you can enjoy it on the simplest level that way without so much anxiety. Do you think that, well, based on your life experiences, that this uh, this building a relationship with wine 
in large part is based on just moments in your life and memories of was wines that you consumed at what moment in your life and you know you didn't have a lot of money and what wine did you get and how did that uh, bring that moment in your life to be so significant that you remembered it well i think that's one of the uh, essential features about wine and and one that makes it uh such a, a singular beverage it it uh it brings back memories. It stands for for times and places and people and and meals. And um, but for me, the most important thing in in sort of uh, 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 feeling comfortable with wine is is developing is starting to think of it as something ordinary rather than than something. Uh, you know, reserved for Saturday nights yeah. or, or celebrations or, or something like that. That just kind of contributes to the uh, the pedestal that we yes. put it on. But if you have it on your, your dinner table uh, nightly, as it was meant to be, uh, just a simple uh, accompaniment to food and family or friends, uh, conviviality, uh, then it becomes less... Uh, mysterious and uh, less intimidating, and when you can kind of embrace the the ordinary thing about wine, then you sort of open yourself to what's extraordinary about it. I keep, uh, right at this moment, I'm thinking of a book that I read several years ago that was on the history of uh, World War II and what was going on in France. And I remember that people, in uh, elderly in particular, it was a major problem that their wine allocation was reduced or taken away from them, which was such a part of their daily caloric intake. And wine being such a huge part of the culture and the daily living, that I love your expression that it is so ordinary. It's just a part of the fabric of life. You know, um, and that's... Uh, you start off thinking of, uh, of it that way. It, it's on your table like bread or, or salt. It's a staple, a grocery. And, um, you know, it, on, it only takes on this sort of uh, intimidating aspect when, when you don't have it around and you mm-hmm. kind of approach it as an other, that, you know, something you've got to, uh, to beat down and master yes. so that you yes. can always, uh, you, you can always know it. And um, to me, the wonderful thing about wine is, is its mystery. Um, you know, there's a, a convenient phrase that people use, oh, we're going to demystify wine for you. And um, uh, it was the importer, Terry Thies, who said, no, we need to remystify wine. And I, I believe in that strongly. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I, I'm so uh, concerned about the the prevalence of, of tasting note language yeah. because it, it it conveys that we can uh, capture every aspect of uh, of a wine just simply by analyzing what's in a glass and, and writing it down and that nails it down for us and, and uh, we're th- therefore uh, we've mastered it and um, great wine is is not like that. Great wine is always has a, a, a story to tell. Um, in Hugh Johnson's words, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't provide answers. It poses questions. Yes, yeah. I think that's a, a way, to, a wonderful way to think of wine. Years ago, I was publishing a newsletter, and I was put I was producing these exhaustive tasting notes, and then I came up to a point in my life where I decided it's absurd because it just reflects my opinion at that moment in time and the mood I was in, et cetera, et cetera. But it has nothing to do with an experience that someone else might get out of the wine. And uh, on a quote from, is it Paul, is it Greco? Paul Greco. Greco. Eric Asimov tells us to listen to what the wine in our glass is telling us. And for, as you say, story, for every person, a wine may be saying something different. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, your experience uh, uh, parallels many people's experience. You, you, 
you read wine magazines, consumer magazines, and, and listen to what people uh, say about wine, read blogs, and, and that's what they're doing. They're writing tasting notes and, and uh, you know, listing dozens of wines and, and trying to differentiate uh, between them. And, and it, it, it's such a, um, it, it's a very powerful thing because it, it suggests that that's the way to talk about wine. And I think a lot of people, when they actually immerse themselves in wine and, and have enough experiences that they feel comfortable themselves, the absurdity of, of this begins yes. to make itself clear. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Why is, in your opinion, why is it important to be humble? Well, um, because it goes back to the notion of, of the mystery of wine and allowing ourselves to to embrace that and, and live in the question. You know, we don't need to know whether it tastes like uh, boysenberries or raspberries mm-hmm. or, or cherries or cloudberries. Um, we can feel comfortable to, to know that wine is going to change. Uh, it's going to change in the bottle as it ages. It's going to change in the glass as you have it sitting in front of you over time. We're talking about good wines here. Uh, it's a very important distinction between uh, good wines and sort of mass-produced commodity wines. It's a, it's a difference between uh, fine ingredients in food and, and sort of uh, industrially produced ingredients. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, somebody that I interviewed, oh gosh, within the last month or so, and it was uh, something about Pinot Noir, said that you recently wrote an article that w- was, uh, you were... Um, you were talking about how wine expresses itself, specifically for Pinot Noir in different terroir. And that is, there is, there is no simplicity in that, but there is a lot of listening that's going on to be able to write about that. Um, well, absolutely. And uh, again, um, you know, if going back to being humble, I, I don't... Um, pretend to have a, a mastery where I can say wine, wine that comes from one place tastes like this and wine that comes from another place tastes like that. Um, and I, I think sometimes we uh, expect that from, uh, we expect that kind of certainty in wines, but there are so many different uh, variables, the, the producer, the weather, the, um, uh, you know, the, the quality of the grape vines, uh, the agriculture, the viticulture, um, it's very hard to to link a specific flavor to a specific taste but, or place. But it is of great interest to many people to pay attention to those sort of variables and the results of those variables, which was, I'm sure, what you the point that you were trying to make. Well, yeah. I, I must say, Eric Asimov, it's once again a pleasure to talk to you. And I, I'm sure that you're going to have so much success with How to Love Wine, a memoir and manifesto. And we thank you for your time today. My pleasure. We will have links up for you to learn more. You're listening to Wine and Dine. Now you can listen to Wine and Dine Radio while shopping at the grocery store or your neighborhood wine merchant. Wine and Dine Radio can be heard using your wireless internet on your cell phone. You're listening to iWine Radio. iWine Radio is a production of Food Tastes Better with Wine on the web at iWineRadio.com. Hey guys, I thank you for listening to iWine Radio and we are still the only wine channel on iTunes Radio. If you go look under iTunes Radio icon and scroll down to News and Talk Directory and it's listed alphabetically, click on that and the stream comes up immediately. iWineRadio.com where you can find links to individual guests. And if anyone's interested in advertising or becoming an underwriter or sponsor, please contact us at iWineRadio.com. We really, really appreciate your support. The more support we get, the more conversations I can have with fascinating people around the world, including you. If you have a story to tell that you'd like to share, 
on iWineRadio. Go to iWineRadio.com and contact us, and we'll go from there.